So thank you so much to all the panelists for fantastic uh, views and different perspectives, which I think are really useful when it comes to talking about a decision aid as a useful tool that's fit for purpose for all stakeholders' views. And what really struck me, I think, is, is, sort of the, is the concept of looking at what questions do you want to answer before you start to look at what, what data you might want to use, because certain data sets and then data sources may be more relevant to answer specific questions than others. Uh, so I do wonder before, I see people are standing up clearly ready to go, but just before we start taking questions from the audience, whether we can have a quick reflection from each of the panelists around this specific decision aid and the questions that it's sort of posing. So questions like, what is the clinical event that you're capturing? Could the real-world evidence, real world evidence element recognize this particular event accurately? Is there a danger of distortion or bias? It's these sorts of questions. Are they the right questions? And is the sequence logical to you? Jeff, do you want to start? Well, so I, I did try and go back when we were discussing this as a group and, uh, and sort of fit the pilot project that, um, that we were involved in in terms of you know, where, when it answered these questions. And I guess I was a little left thinking, well, yes, in some regards it did, you know, meet on, on sort of both sides. And so um, while I think that, uh, that maybe the, the pilot project that we were involved in was a, was a nice proof of concept about what was uh, possible, um, it would have to be sort of taken um, one, one, one level, I don't want to say lower, um, to a different level uh, in terms of, uh, of, of understanding which, uh, which data source um, was most appropriate for the questions that we were asking. Because I think arguably we had very high quality curated data sources that were involved from the beginning. So um, maybe, we, maybe we sort of followed this decision guide by just automatically assuming we wouldn't be able to answer the questions that we were asking through a Fitbit. Lynn. I think, to be honest, and, and, and Brandy and I had a similar reaction when we looked at this, it feels like the left side of the guide is for data collected in a clinical setting, so perhaps a randomized pragmatic trial, and the right side is around patient reported data, mm -hmm. and what's missing is what we shared, what, what Brandon tried to articulate, which is existent okay. aggregated observational data assets. Um, when, and that's all I work with entirely. I, I work with an existent asset, and when I go through the process of asking myself questions about is this data fit for purpose, um, those, those questions are not entirely reflected here. And I think Luca filled in a couple of the gaps mm -hmm. with his questions, but there's something missing about what you do when you're working with an existent mm -hmm. observational data asset that isn't reflected in this tool. Yeah. So Robert, how, how do we, is this possible to operationalize, do you think? So, so I think that, yeah, so the, this is really, um, I think, uh, like I, I said, my comments, it's got a lot of the concepts, but um, I think this is maybe what Jeff was saying, is that uh, the devil is in the details. And um, it is a little hard to know um, exactly how this translates in, into a specific uh, set of data resources. To, to Lynn's point, such as claims or EHRs. Um, and then I think the other point, uh, again, kind of from the user uh, regulator perspective, is um, the, these, if, if, let's say, if this was something that was handed to an FDA reviewer, would they be able to use it to help us to assess the quality of data, a data set that they were given? And I would say, number one, it's probably too high level to, to be useful there. But it also comes from the perspective of the, the data generator as mm -hmm. opposed to the data user. Mm -hmm. So there might be another, a need for sort of another set of columns for like the data user. And Luca, you pointed out some missing boxes. Uh, how do you see this working in, in, in data generation, particularly in, in the field that you're in at the moment? I think it's a good aid to decision making. Could you could you hear me? Um, I um, as a, I'm a, I'm a practitioner, so I'm really like the guy that does the analysis in the end, mm. and so I feel like this is still a little bit high level to be mm. actionable. Um, and uh, but yeah, the direction are right. Uh, what I would like to see is probably a way to summarize what's true for everyone. So there is a common layer of truth of uh, 
data relevancy and data quality that's above the determination of is it an existing accent, is it patient-generated data, or is it a, a traditional RWD. So maybe singling that out, uh, that allows us to really look at the devil in the details for the specific use cases. And Brande, you, you talked about sort of the flow chart and the thought process you might go through as a company when you when you study uh, when you're bringing drugs to market. How do you see this work? So I agree with um, Lynn's comment about most of the time when we're talking about a regulatory decision, this data has to be reflective of the U.S. population. Mm -hmm. And there are very few um, data sources in EHR claims that are truly reflective of the population. Um, and, the, and the same can to be said of primary data collection in a clinical setting um, to try to collect variables. Um, so I think the questions that come down to, and, and this is probably a little bit contrary, so my background is Six Sigma, um, and so variability is the enemy. Mm. And what I would say is in this case, because of the large data, um, you know, it's actually the systematic bias that is the, the enemy that we have to address first. I spent a lot of my career um, really looking down at how do I minimize variability versus I think the new approach is how do you maximize data points and really think about systematic bias. So those things about which patients are participating, why are they participating, if they're not feeling well, what, where is that? I think um, we need to shift our focus a little bit more to systematic bias to really understand the clinical context. Mm -hmm. um, statistics um, are important, um, but I just read an article today about in JAMA, you know, the clinical context of things can't be um, replaced by statistical measures. Mm -hmm. So I guess there is, to some extent, a debate around whether we provide higher level guidance versus operationalized instructions. So that's probably a conversation that we can have. Uh, I'll give, give the, the space to the floor now for questions. Yeah, thank you. Rima Izam, FDA. Uh, I had a question um, to actually all the panelists, but maybe especially the ones that use retrospective data. Um, one thing that I came to appreciate in the past few years is um, the dynamic nature of the data and how that can change the type of answers that you get. And I was surprised that dynamic nature of the data didn't make it into the list of uh, validity because I would put it there. So um, the, the type of studies that we conduct are often assuming that the data is static in like mm -hmm. the way we do epidemiological studies. The way we even think about um, positive predictive value is sort of assuming that you have to do it once and for all and it's gonna assure the validity mm -hmm. of that algorithm over time when things can change. Um, the data, um, even if you fix your study period, if you do another take of the data, it can change. And also, even the data partners that we work with, they can they buy other companies. <laughs> so even for retrospective data, the data is never quite static like a clinical trial data would be. So can you speak for that a little bit? And also what you think may be some ways to quant quantify um, how that can impact um, sort of um, study results. Yeah, thank you. Lynn, do you want to take that one first, or <laughs> to put you on the spot? Sure. I, I think um, you, you know you're absolutely right, and it's sort of like a you know, I could have I should have had a V8 moment. Um, does that reflect my age? Does anyone know what that means? Um, <laughs> I, there's lots of different types of um, dynamism. Is that the word? There's lots of different ways the data is dynamic. So, and you mentioned several of them. Um, you know the you know, here, an example for us is where we were doing a study um, sponsored by um, a federal agency, and we started the study in September using linked EHR and claims data, um, and then wanted to refresh the data. We did the first part in claims, the second part in EHR, and then we wanted to refresh the claims part. Um, and in between, um, the, the data provider of our, of our EHR data, which is an organization that was called Humedica and was purchased by Optum, had a change in their client base. And this caused data to be removed from the environment. And that changed the sample size. It, it, it didn't change the direction of the findings, but it certainly changed the magnitude. Um, that's one type of, of dynamic nature. The other is sort of, um, I don't know if zeitgeist is the right word, but of practice patterns in particular disease areas. And so if you're doing a longitudinal study, you do have to think about what is the, the nature of practice 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. And um, Mayo Clinic has a very nice publication where they use administrative claim data to reflect um, regulatory changes. And um, the data is a little bit hard to look at, but you can see 
points in time where there were regulatory changes or formulary changes or different types of policy changes and how clinical outcomes varied substantially based on those changes. Um, so you're right, it's very complex, and I think that's probably something that, that we should be reflecting. It's a, it occurs at so many different levels, even the way that things are measured. Um, you know, uh, measures that are taken in office. For example, pain scales. There's going to be huge change now, I think, in the way that we use pain scales because it's you know, definitely involved from being, you know, the fifth vital sign, or is it the fourth, but being a vital sign to being something we're much more careful with in the frequency with which we assess it and our reaction to it. So I think the use of pain scores is going to have to change in how we handle them from mm -hmm. more recent data to, to older data. Mm -hmm. um. I live in a world uh, where I'm uh, lucky. Uh, I see I see my data ac assets as already existing, but living in the fragmented space of everyone's smartphones and clouds, and uh, and and owned by them. So whenever I need to, uh, whenever I want to Im enact a research query, uh, I'm just querying these distributed data sets, which really allows me to uh, uh, be really clear about permission and, and, and truthful about that, but also refresh my findings much more uh, frequently, much more easily as, as compared to you know, uh, the example that uh, Aline had. So uh, going back to refresh a query uh, direct to patients is, uh, is extremely easier uh, as compared to traditional RWD. Mm -hmm. And I guess this takes us to a concept of dynamic regulation, but that's a completely different kettle of fish. <laughs> Well, and I, and I know we're not supposed to bring the um, analytic uh, portions of the discussion here, but I had referred to you can't separate the, the data and analytics piece. And so the other thing is um, replication of results in different data, you know, to see the magnitude is also another thing that gives us, again, reduces the fear against that variation. Um, you know, can you replicate? <laughs> Mark. Hi, um, I'm Mark Berger. I've been participating in the Duke Margolis Initiative. I've also I've been participating in some joint task forces between ISPOR and ISPI that have been addressing these questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Lynn does a magnificent job of pointing out that data is dirty. And I, my I always say is all data is dirty. The question is, is it useful? Mm -hmm. And we already know it's useful because the FDA is using it now for, sa for years for safety surveillance and detecting rare adverse events. So we know it's useful for that. The question then, is it useful now on the effectiveness side or comparative effectiveness or whatever you want to say? Yeah. Um, and there's some things that were not highlighted in the discussion, but I thought Jeff's talk was a wonderful uh, exposition around how you need to look at multiple data sets. Um, you should never trust any one study. I don't trust any one study, whether it's an RCT mm -hmm. Or it's a, a observational study, unless it has a humongous you know, effect size. But if you do get multiple data sets, uh, you can get some confidence that, some, that you don't expect all the bias to be the same across all these data sets. Now, Jeff couldn't really talk about, well, some of the data sets he was using were very small, and some were very large. So I don't know if the outliers had to do with sample size. Also, the mix of drugs that were being used from one to the other might be very different. I suspect when you look at all of that, his results will even look better in terms of the consistency across the different data sets. And if you get that kind of information, is that good enough? Well, I think a couple of things that we've talked about uh, and has been talked about here are really paramount issues. One is transparency around um, how the data is curated. Right now, no data provider actually publishes and says, here is how I curate the data. You have no idea how good it is. Some data curators are really, really good at it. Some are not so good at it. So that we've known this for years. Some data sets are very dirty, some are very clean. So being transparent and being able to have the provenance to be able to go back and say, for key variables, I can go back and check the original source document is a very important thing. We need to demand that these be made public so you can evaluate the, the quality of the curation that was done. And then on the other side, when people want to analyze the data, we haven't talked enough about study hygiene. So in study hygiene, we. In clinical trials, you declare a hypothesis, 
You have to, for phase two and beyond, register that study on a, on a, on a website, and then you do what you did. And if you change it, you have to let everybody know that you changed it. There are no such rules for observational studies. There needs to be an adoption. We've proposed out of the eSport Task Force that there should be a mechanism to allow people to pre-register, recognizing there are problems, and it may not be perfect, but we need to get into the, the culture that indeed you have to have a question first and design that question and not are just doing data, data dredging and finding what's going out. Yeah, excellent. And then yeah. once you execute the study, you have to be transparent enough, and this is where the ISPE led group came in and said, you have to let people know what you did well enough so that if they had access to the same data set, they should get approximately the same answer. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that transparency in the publications. It's often impossible to know exactly what was done in terms of the analysis. We need to bring observational data up to the same level of scrutiny as we have RCTs, and then we can start talking about, is it fit for purpose? It is fit for purpose if you do all of that. And that can be done quickly, and that's not captured mm -hmm. in your guidelines. Okay. So panel, excellent points. Is the solution quite simple then? Is about transparency and replication, uh, being able to reproduce your results? So, so within Sentinel, we, we have posted our data quality approach, and um, we uh, uh, have, we, um, we are trying to be transparent about our, our study protocols, our approaches, and I think we're 80, 90 percent there. So we're in agreement that this is a good approach. Whether or not it is the only thing you have to do, I think, is probably another question. Jeff, any quick response from you? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> and that, that's actually one thing that we've like talked about as is could this be an, a relatively easy, well, a next step, you know, to be able to take sort of the ten areas of potential variability that we observed in this pilot project and try and define them in a way that there's a degree of uniformity, and it was sort of interesting just you know, over the last couple of months um, for even people that weren't involved in our pilot project, if we shared the definitions with them, the response was sort of, you know, like, yeah, okay, these make pretty good sense. But, um, you know, it did take, um, I think it took a fair amount of collaboration amongst all the participants and a willingness to do this, you know, in order to do things like share codes, share definitions, mm -hmm. you know, talk through some of the issues that were being encountered in a way um, that was, um, uh, you know, I think a, a very intentional in terms of saying, like, um, e you know, even though it may seem like a little variable in terms of who censors what when, um, you know, if it's not done the same across every data set, it can result in large variability that otherwise may not have been identified. So, um, you know, I think at least from our uh, our subset of groups here that we were working with, I think there was a, a, a large acknowledgement and desire to try and you know, to try and do that, not only in the context of this proof of concept, um, but even as sort of an indicator of probably what needs to be done sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on something, you know, that Bob talked about regarding quality control and use a term I really like, sort of the industrialization of that quality checking process. You know, I, I always hold Sentinel up as the marvelous example of that. but. And I'd be especially you know, interested in hearing from Lynn and Jeff and, and maybe other people about your experience with this. My, my, uh, the, the, the claim I would make is that the value of that industrialized process where we do it over and over again all the time is not even so much in the, the sort of technical quality or the efficiency, but in creating that culture of owning up to errors. Um, and and I, I'm curious about how that's worked in some of these other settings about being able to go back to data generators and say there's a problem and how doing that repeatedly creates a culture where people are more likely to come clean about things. Um, you know, I, some of you heard me say I refer to following Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the four stages of data quality grief, you know, <laughs> which starts with denial, there's nothing wrong with my data. Anger, why are you bothering me about my data? Bargaining, 
if I patch it now, will you, will you not tell anybody about it? And then finally, acceptance, I'll own up and go back and fix it at the source or acknowledge it can't be fixed. Um, but, but in terms of that, that cult, because this is a cult, as much a cultural or a technical process, so I'm, I'd be interested in your thoughts about how you get that to work. So who wants to talk about the cultural shift that we need to go through? Um, I think that the challenge with the, I, I agree, the, the culture of, a culture of quality, um, when, in observ, in, when in the observational world we were largely working with claims data, it was, it was much, much easier. The providence and um, processing of claims data is relatively well known. Now, it's not, it's not perfect. There's, you know, that we, we, we often give claims data a pass when maybe we shouldn't because the processing of the data makes a difference. Um, but with, with EHR data, I'm not sure which of the grief phases is overwhelmed, but that's the one that I'm in um, because I worry about talking about it in terms of an industrial process because, and I'm not sure what we necessarily mean by that, but in my opinion, every data element in an EHR environment needs its own process for quality checking, derivation, normalization, and, and that has to be known and spelled out. And so we're talking about massive, a massive amount of documentation work and quality checking that needs to be done. And, you know, at least, you know, in my experience, these data databases were generated originally for the purposes of health outcomes research. And we were not thinking about regulatory decision making. And so they were assembled perhaps without that in mind. I think Flatiron is a very different story. They put their, from the very beginning, my understanding is that Flatiron was thinking about regulatory. And that makes it an extremely expensive process to aggregate from that perspective. It makes it um, incredibly valuable, but it's also inaffordable to, for some organizations to operate that way. Um, those data assets are intended for larger budget projects, I would imagine. Um, so I think, I, I think it's absolutely true that we need to be developing a sense of quality that is embedded in our ag data aggregation process, but it does mean that um, many da data <coughs> aggregators are going to have to go back into their assets and sort of rethink or at least better document how they've been assembled. I don't know if I totally avoided the question. Um, <laughs> That may reflect that, you know, it's, it's a very, very big job. And, you know, at, at Academy Health, um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a panel about the assembling and linking of data. And at the end of the panel, I went up and asked, what proportion of your time do you spend on quality? And the panelists, you know, time and budget, and the panelists sort of laughed, and they were sort of like 90%. Like, that's it. That's the, the key to creating these, these data assets is paying attention to the quality and assemblage. Important points. I think we have 10 minutes left and a few questions lined up, so I think we'll move on to the next question, please. Um, so actually, uh, my question was sort of similar, and it's not really a question, it's a comment, but I mean, the purpose of the EHR is primarily patient care, and when I read this, could real-world providers in these settings accurately recognize or evaluate this event or health state? How might the recording systems, e.g. EHR format, in this provider setting influence or distort the accurate recording of the provider's assessment or diagnosis? I mean, that's a huge problem for me as a patient if my doctor can't record what's happening with me accurately and in a way that's meaningful the next time he looks at it. So, um, so I would say that, um, that, that, first of all, I would say that the order is wrong here and that, and that the data collection in a harmonized, accurate, standardized way should be first. And even though that's not what's happening now all the time, that that's what we should be moving toward, and that there are people who are moving toward that. So, for example, ACOG has developed this prenatal record where, um, where, where, where it fits much more into the workflow of the physician, and it, it sits on top of the EHR. The ACC had a meeting a few months ago about developing the next generation EHR that fits into the workflow of um, cardiologists, and that collects data that's meaningful, standardized, um, you know, and, and that this could impact multiple stakeholders. It could impact the regulatory, it impacts quality reporting, and most importantly, it impacts patient care. So I, I guess my question is why aren't we following up on those opportunities and, and not accepting the status quo? <laughs> opportunities, that's a positive spin. So. 
I, I think it's a um, I think it's a great point. You mentioned the d data entered into a health record that is useful the next time you see your physician. But what about another physician or another specialty or another institution? You know, probably creates even a bigger challenge. Um, but I think you followed up on a key element in order to think about success here, and that is um, how it fits into the workflow. Mm -hmm. um, it seems when you disrupt the workflow, uh, things don't get adopted so well. I do wonder, in relation to that, do we have potentially different decision aids depending on who the key recipient is? And that could possibly be to your point that we could have a different one when it's actually the perspective of the healthcare provider and, and the patient. Next question, please. Hi, I'm Richard Platt. I'm, I'm interested in your, um, in your thoughts about whether we need uh, multiple standards for whether data is fit for purpose. Uh, so, sometimes we care about whether uh, one treatment is more effective than another. But in a lot of situations, we care about whether the treatment effectiveness is comparable. So in non-inferiority situations, a lot of the a lot of the dirtiness that we might uh, accept in data if we see a difference would serve to obscure a real difference that we might care about. And I realize this is th this is really the same question asked in two different ways, mm -hmm. but uh, and, and if we talk about a continuum of data being fit for purpose, do we need to establish different standards if we're interested in establishing non-inferiority? Mm -hmm. Robert, do you want to try and address that one? So, so yeah, it's, I think you know narrowly focusing on this non-inferiority question, and this this is a big question. And it would uh, I would say this is my own opinion, not the FDA's opinion, that I wouldn't even try to do a non-inferiority study using real-world data at this point. Um, I would start somewhere further upstream on an easier problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and then over time, maybe we'd get enough experience to address this the, the non inferiority issue. At a practical level, um, you know, within this, the, our experience in safety, we do this implicitly um, based on the question. If there's a question of what is drug use or what is the, we just want to describe a population, we're a little more tolerant of, um, you know, data quality. But when we're down to saying we need to make an inference about, you know, does this drug cause this. Um, safety problem, you know, we want the best data, the best methods, you know, so uh, I, I think whether we say this, do this explicitly or not, it will happen. I think we've got Luca and then Brandon next. I think different standards may be warranted and also uh, uh, enabled by, by new opportunities. So in the going to go back to the patient-generated health data, uh, it's much more easy in that context to go and collect uh, the same, the re-perform re, re the same observational study in a different population, which is really the way you should think about solving a lot of problems that have to do with reproducibility, uh, the validity of the findings, and even data quality. Even in an ideal world like Mark uh, painted of what, when, you, when you set out the analysis that you want to do, up front, there's still sometimes leeways that you leave in how the imputation is done or how the outlier are removed. Is this sensor or the winds arising? And all those things can affect the significance of your results. You really should be you really should be adjusting for any decision that you take during the analysis at the end, which is impossible. So the really only good way of reproducing finding that the machine learning community from which I belong has found after burning themselves a lot of time of not being able to reproduce it is really do that on a holdout data set, do that on a third party data set. And patient generated health data makes that possible before that, that wasn't possible. And Brandy. And again, from my perspective as an industry representative, one real world um, evidence study does not substantive evidence make, just like no, no one clinical trial does make substantive mm -hmm. evidence. So I think the important things here is to understand where does the real world evidence fit within the context of the decision? Is it within an already established safety and efficacy profile? That's a much different question than when it's a fit within a non-established safety and efficacy profile in a patient population. So absolutely, we need to understand what those um, levers of substantial evidence is and where the real world evidence mm -hmm. plays. And that will then inform how your um, data quality and your analysis will be done. We are approaching lunch, but we have time for one or two more questions, so please. Thank you. 
<clears throat> I'm Diana Zuckerman, president of the National Center for Health Research. I wanted to follow up on that replication uh, topic, which of course is essential, um, and the transparency, which is part of that, because we need transparency in order to do replication. But, but the other issue is resources and access to the data. And you know who's going to have the resources to do a replication of these huge data set and these huge analyses? And e does even the FDA have the resources if they're going to be getting data from these kinds of sources? Mm -hmm. um, those of you who know mm -hmm. that FDA for clinical trials will reanalyze the data. Mm -hmm. What will they do with these huge kind of data sets? Will they have the resources to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. That takes us to the question of, of responsibility, you know, ownership and cost sharing. Any reflections from the panel on that? Uh, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, and the, the hesitation on the panel denotes how great that is. <laughs> um, I, I think that... Um, in the case of patient-generated health data uh, and the ability to uh, redo, replicate study more easily, uh, that, uh, that it, it's going to help in this direction as well. And what really our experience that we see at Evidation, but either, either our company that are enabled these kind of studies, everyone now can run their own little Fitbit studies. It's going to be 20 people. It's going to be all your friends and family. But you can all ask them directly just like through a survey that you push to them. So FDA might have eventually to deal with you know, hundreds of little data sets of replica independently replicated uh, Fitbit studies. Uh, and maybe that constitutes uh, evidence at that point like in this direction. And, and Brandy, what, what's the, your industry view? So I think there's two types of replication. One type of replication is replicating the study, which is you know using the same data set. Um, and obviously, that, that helps you with internal uh, validity of the, of the study. The more important replication, I think, in real world evidence is replicating it in different data sets, similar mm -hmm. to what we're talking about in Sentinel and the Friends of Cancer Research. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as being able to access that data, I think you know this is this is a problem for us too. Yeah. Of of you know, as a pharmaceutical company, most of the world owns the data around our product, not not us, and that's a big change that we're um, coming over in the in the in in this new new paradigm. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know there is a big movement that we need to understand from patients and others that. You know, if it, they have to have a strong voice in ownership of the mm -hmm. data, yeah. but let's not also underestimate. There's a lot of cost to aggregating this data mm -hmm. as well. So, um, what the cost model is, I'm not sure, yeah. um, but it is it is a good question. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You know, I, I think one thing to that we also have to keep in mind. There's of course the issue of the cost of the data aggregators and recouping those costs, and that's their product, but. Patient privacy is also somewhat at odds with the access issue. So, you know, there is nothing that my organization fears more than a breach in data privacy. And so that is what drives our, you know, our construction of our entire environment is around data privacy and protecting that data. Um, we can't allow, for example, our partners to use all of our data. They have to be in certified, de-identified views, where if you have geography, you can't have race. Um, so I think you can't ignore the, the importance and the, the limitations that the data privacy issues have, have placed on us in terms of data sharing and access. Mm -hmm. Perhaps one final very brief question. Yeah, just a simple one. That this, this one's been bugging me for a long time, so I'll go ahead and raise it. I mean, this is about a data element, and it says, when is a real-world data element fit? <laughs> and the emperor here is the um, artificial environment of a person showing up every once in a while to a research clinic on some schedule and having some technician or nurse typically ask a set of questions and record that in some way and then try to match it up with some part of the um, health record for, quote, source data validation. So I just wonder whether, um, and, and 10 years ago when we were first looking at electronic health records, we began to see that what was in the clinical trial record sometimes didn't actually match with what you saw when you looked at, and then as, and then as we look at more data now, we see if you look at these multiple dimensions, 
you see a lot of stuff happening in people's lives that they're not necessarily talking about when they go to the research clinic. So it, seem, it, it seems to me we should take out the word real world data. And now that we're in, a, in an environment where we can look at the patient's entire experience, including all the hospitals that they go to and the clinics mm -hmm. that they go to, we ought to really be asking the question about the traditional FDA regulated clinical trial. How accurate is that information really compared to what's actually mm -hmm. important to a person, which mm -hmm. is, after all, the purpose of the FDA? So I'm interested in your, yeah. have any of you begun to look and see where traditional clinical trials data elements may not actually be reflective of what you really want to know when you have all the other data? Perhaps a very brief response to that. And as an industry sponsor, we deal with that every day, right? I mean, our patients are out in the, in the real world. We're asked to um, provide safety um, updates for our products to ensure that we have a, 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 an appropriate benefit risk profile for the general population. But also, we deal with payers. Um, who want to pay for value of their their products, mm -hmm. and um, we also deal with um, things like patient copays or patients who are paying out of pocket costs. And if we ignore what the patients want, and we're not making a drug that actually is meaningful for them, we we're not we can get regulatory approval and not have any um, impact to the patient health that we're trying to make. And so for us, the patient-focused drug development initiatives are. Um, really key as well and starting to think about what is important to the patient. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at patient reported outcomes and clinical outcomes assessment measures, we can tell you that the patients and clinicians do not value the same endpoints. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I it's think, a, it's yeah, a conundrum. Yeah. <laughs> There's an opportunity here to perhaps reshift and reshape our thinking and put the patient at the centre. That's a very good point. I, I think we'll have to end now. I'd like to thank the panel for a fantastic discussion and input. <laughs>